uh, the title of his presentation is Late Quaternary Environments of Eastern Oregon, Forest and Fire History of the Blue Mountains. Please welcome Peter Maringer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've been in for surprises since I came here this morning. To begin with, I took the wrong turn off the freeway and ended up down the road in Cove. And they, <laughs> I couldn't find your lab. <laughs> And, uh, but I finally made it here. And then when I got here, they said, uh, oh, you're going to be taped today. And here's your microphone. And uh, so, uh, but having uh, recently spent some time, uh, uh, a long time actually, many, many months in China, I've come to accept the fact that uh, we're just all so much flotsam on life's river. So I'll float along with it. And uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, I like to do several things today. It's always uh, uh, every time you start to put one of these lectures together, you say, well, what should I do this time? Because I've already done what I did last time. And uh, so I thought today that uh, we'd start out by talking about some of the perspectives on uh, changes through time. Uh, what do we know about them? And uh, what do they look like in the interior Northwest for uh, oh, the last 20,000 years or so? Uh, then I like to point out, in the process of doing that, that the past is the key to the present. If we want to understand uh, the present ecosystems, we need to know their history. Uh, and I have some, I hope, good examples of that. Uh, and then I'd like to say just a little bit about some of the, the methods uh, that are used. I have a few slides of coring and this sort of thing to get you in the spirit. And then. Uh, I guess, gee, we're in the Northwest, so there's no way I can talk about uh, uh, records of the past uh, vegetation in the Northwest unless we first say something about volcanic ashes, tephra, because they're so important in uh, dating our sites. Uh, and then I think uh, we'll go to uh, the Steens Mountains. Uh, Steens Mountains is a place I've worked for many years. Uh, because I like to go there, I always manage to find something to do that takes me there. And uh, so um, I'd just like to say a few words about some of the, the work there uh, and take Western Juniper as an example. And then um, we want to look at the upper and lower limits of Western Juniper over the whole of the scene. Then I would like to uh, come back to a place called Lost Lake, which some of you may know. It's uh, not so far from here. It's in the Blue Mountains uh, and uh, oh, about 30 miles from Dale. Do you all know where that is? You're all Oregonians. I, you must. And uh, you get there on the road to Olive Lake as though you were going over from near Ukiah to Granite in that area. And if you've driven down that road, how many of you have driven down that road? A lot of you. You notice that as you, as you drive along towards Olive Lake, that uh, there's a ridge up on your right-hand side. And every once in a while, that ridge has a cirque in it where I sat there during, oh, I don't know, 20,000 to maybe 15,000 years ago. And, uh, and uh, then beneath those cirques are some moraines. So there are a couple of lakes in there that uh, are down in, uh, oh, the mixed conifer forest now. And behind those moraines are a couple of lakes. And one of these is Jump Off Joe Lake. Uh, and the other one is Lost Lake. And that's the one I'll say something about. Um, and uh, so the way I thought I'd do this is I have some overheads uh, to start out with. And then I have some slides to mix in with them. So when we start to show slides, I'll move this out of the way. And then each time, I'll push it back again <laughs> and uh, get everything focused up. I think it'll work fine. Uh, and then I can't move very much because I'm being taped. And uh, so normally I'm a roamer. But with the crowd in here, I couldn't roam anyway. So if I look like I'm going to sleep, I'm not. I'm just not moving. Uh, let's see. How do we start out? First of all, when we ask, well, what do we know about the history of the quaternary vegetation of Oregon? And you look up at this map, uh, and you have to say, oh my gosh, not very much. Uh, each of those circles is a site where we know something. And uh, uh, excuse me, I'm going to have to turn my back to you to find myself on the map. Uh, and if we look down in southeastern Oregon right here, um, 37, 33, and 31 on the map, that's all in the Steens Mountains area. That's work that I've done 
at Fish Lake, at uh, Wild Horse Lake, and that my students and I have done at Diamond Pond. Uh, okay, and then uh, there's, uh, in the Sylvie's Valley, there's a little bit of a record. Uh, it doesn't go back very far, and it's not in very good detail from a place called Craddock Meadows. Okay. Uh, and we come north from there, and this, this is Lost Lake, a place I want to talk about a little today uh, in the blues. And then this uh, is uh, Twin Lakes. How many of you know Twin Lakes in the Wallawas? It's on the south side, not far from Duck Lake. I think Duck Lake's pretty well known because it has some unusual aquatic plants, as I understand it. So we're not far from Duck Lake. And I just had uh, a student, Abigail Beck, just finished up a master's thesis looking at the pollen, uh, algae, uh, and uh, from the last, oh, about 4,000 years from cores from um, um, Twin Lakes. So, gosh, that's not very much, is it? Now, and then right now, I'm in the process of putting together a report for uh, uh, Lost Lake in, uh, again, not far away here in the blues. Uh, and uh, that isn't finished yet, but uh, there'll be a report. It's just actually supported as a challenge grant out uh, of uh, the John Day office. Uh, and uh, then, uh, as a matter of fact, all of this work was started about 10 years ago by archaeologists uh, who were in the Pendleton office or in Baker. Guy Martin's here. He was involved in that. And we got cores with a little bit of help from the Forest Service. And then that kind of help kind of fell away. And then uh, someone got interested again and said, well, would you go back to Lost Lake and see what else you can find out? And I said, oh, sure, of course. And so we have. Um, well, as you can see, that's, that's really not very much. It's, I mean, Eastern Oregon is hardly known at all. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's about all we can talk about. And the, the work at Lost Lake is, is still in progress, but it's coming along very well. Well, um, I like to say, I think I'll just stick with the overheads here for a minute and point out, no, I better not. I better go to the slides. Yeah, something's coming up here that I need the slides for. Uh, so if I turn this off, yeah, okay, when we begin, begin to look at the, the records of, of uh, vegetation history, uh, and of course vegetation is tied to climate and many other things as well, but when we begin to look at the record, what we see is that we have biotic responses uh, and I think of the record and say, we'll just go back 20,000 years, just a short time, and look at the vegetation for this region, for the interior northwest. And what we find is that, that uh, the vegetation is responding to short, sharp climatic changes. One of the things we always keep in mind when we think about the Pleistocene is that it's, I don't know what you learned about the ice ages when you went to school, but I know what I learned in my geomorphology class when I was a freshman a long time ago, and that's that there were four ice ages, and they were always drawn like this, right, big loops. Well, what we've come to understand is there certainly aren't four, maybe there's 40, do you know, but there aren't four, and they don't come like this, they come in short, sharp changes, uh, changes in state from one climatic regime to another. So. This is how we have to view the climatic record. Then, of course, along that with that, we have glaciers, uh, very important in the interior northwest, of course. And then beyond the glaciers, uh, other things we have to, to, uh, to uh, remember is that there's the, the changes in the area of where there was water and where there wasn't water. So uh, uh, as you know, with the greatest uh, floods in all of the geologic record, well, almost all of the geologic record occur not far north of you here in central Washington when a dam for a pro-glacial pro lake, Glacial Lake Missoula broke and uh, the uh, flood came through central Washington. Uh, also to the south of us, not very far, uh, in the northern Great Basin in Washington, places like Fort Rock and Catlo Valley and Alvord Valley, uh, there were uh, uh, and Warner Valley, there were great Pleistocene lakes. So those are important. And then the last thing for the Pacific Northwest interior 
that we have to keep in mind are volcanic activities. And anyone who drives uh, the highway south from Bend has to be impressed with the kinds of trees uh, that are occurring on the pumice. Uh, or if you drive up into, or the kinds that aren't, and if you drive up into uh, um, Crater Lake uh, itself, you see there are areas of pumice desert uh, completely occupied by uh, lodgepole pine, for example. Okay, so you might just think, well, how much, for a minute, how much tephra, volcanic ash, fell on the Blue Mountains in various places, and what influence did that have on the forest history since, and what influence had the vol has the ch continuous change in the volcanic soils had? It would be nice to be able to look at a site, for example, in the Blue Mountains, where, where the ash fall was, was incredibly heavy. Uh, I can't tell you what the primary deposit was, but it has to be in 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, something like that. Maybe perhaps it's, it's huge. Uh, and uh, what was the vegetation before that fell and what was it after? It's always an interesting thing to look at in your core as you look up to the point just before a volcanic ash fell and then, then afterwards. Uh, okay, um, so those, there are those things. Now if we take this uh, just a period at a time, what we can say about the interior northwest, and I think all the records show there's, there's, not, there's not much uh, argument about it, is there are not many forests to be had. Oh, there's trees to be had, but the high mountains are covered with glaciers. Uh, the valleys and, and intermediate areas are covered primarily by cold steppe, and the, the climate is a cold continental climate. Now, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 or 13,000 years ago, that changes. Uh, and we see that we have uh, a period we call the late glacial. So let's say from 10,000 to uh, 12,500, something like that. And we begin to see some interesting things happening. Uh, the first thing is that uh, we have an initial treeless interlude still, sagebrush and grass, step, predominate shrubs. Uh, and then we begin to see, this would be throughout the West, vegetation with, with a very much of an alpine character. Let me explain what I mean with that by that. And I'm referring to here is, say, if we were to look at the pollen record from one of these late glacial sites from the Bitterroot Mountains or from the Blue Mountains or from wherever, uh, what we would see is a, a, is a, a combination of, of pollen types, um, sometimes with seeds or macrofossils to go with it, a combination that we'll never see again. Okay? It just isn't there again like that. So it's this transition between the full glacial and, and uh, uh, the late glacial and then into the Holocene uh, that it doesn't come back again. And when we look at the pollen records, it looks something like this. We get a lot of things you say, oh, well, well that's no problem. They all grow here now. Well, some do and some don't. But the point is, we, they're in, in abundance and they're common, and then we just don't see this combination again. And they do have kind of an alpine character. Lots of sagebrush, of course, bistorts, polymoniums, areognums, oxyrhea, which is truly arctic, conegia, which is arctic, uh, and Schipertia canadensis is really an interesting one because you say, oh yeah, Schipertia canadensis, I know it is understory, oh, to ponderosa in the bitter roots, or wherever you know Schipertia canadensis from. But we hardly find it in our Holocene pollen records. And in the late glacial, uh, it's really rather common in these first, these first communities to invade areas that were glaciated. And this not only occurs in the mountains of the interior northwest, but it occurs all the way north uh, through Alaska and Canada as well. It's a, it's a kind of plant that it was very, very successful on, uh, rec on ground recently occupied by ice. And then along with that comes some interesting things. Of course, if you have a lot of rocky open country, you'd expect selaginellas to be more abundant. And in places where selaginella selaginoides is an arctic species, uh, it, it does occur in the high mountains south uh, in the US. Uh, it's not that common. It's usually on limestone. Uh, and uh, then lots of botrychium. Uh, which again kind of gives you this, this you know, botrychium, the little fern that you'd find under the, uh, 
Yeah, where have I seen this? Under the western, un, under the uh, mountain hemlocks around Crater Lake, for example. Uh, and then, of course, Juniperus is one of the first shrubs we see. Uh, then, and that's probably Juniperus communis. Uh, and then finally, our first tree to invade is usually spruce. Yeah. So this happens almost everywhere. And then we don't see this kind of combination again after that. Okay. Well, now in the Holocene, that is the last 10,000 years, uh, we, we need to think of some other things as well. Uh, one of these is that we have, we still have these short, sharp climatic changes. And I know that, that um, sometimes it's easy to think of the Holocene because it's been traditional to think of the Holocene as being divided in three parts with a mid-Holocene warm, dry period. But it really doesn't work that way. There's as much variation within what people have called the altothermal period in the mid-Holocene as, as there is uh, throughout, uh, as there is in any other period. So again, we have these short, sharp environmental shifts and due to climate. Uh, and when we see those, we see that right along with them, and sometimes our evidence for them, are these shifts in, in uh, evidence for shifts in vegetation. Um, and we also know that there is no clear way to look at an area as large as even eastern Oregon and say, well, all of these changes that we would see in a pollen record or in macrofossil record from pack rat middens are going to occur at the same time everywhere. It depends on what's changing and where you are on the landscape. So each site is also peculiar. Uh, and last, uh, the recent appearance of familiar associations. Um, if we were to, if I were to just have you all think of, of, of a, a vegetation type, some, a forest type somewhere, okay, that, uh, that you think of as having uh, uh, deep roots and uh, having to have been in place for a long time. This is in the interior. Would something come to mind for you? The sagebrush community, yeah, forever, and they're with us now. Yeah, sure, and that's, that's there's evidence for that is clear. Yeah, anything, how about a forest community? Do you think of these as all being ephemeral, uh, as uh, species of the communities varying through time? Uh, uh, Ponderosa. Yeah, some sort of ponderosa. Some sort of ponderosa. And that's something that a lot of people would come up with. And you know, it's really interesting because when we look back on our fossil records, what we have less evidence for, and this is throughout the West, not, not just in the Northwest, what we have the least evidence for in our fossil record is ponderosa. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, <clears throat> I think this is just, uh, all I'm trying to do is get you to think that maybe the familiar associations of today didn't come that way. That they came one species at a time, and of course we see them within a lifetime. And that lifetime is just a frame in a movie. And, and they're much more, the, the units, vegetation units are much more ephemeral than that. Now let me take a couple of examples to illustrate this. And one will uh, make perfect sense to you, and I hope the second one doesn't. <laughs> I will be wasting my time. Okay. Here's the first one. If we were to take, just go to the south here a little ways, into, um, yeah, the, there it is, into uh, the northern Great Basin, or in, into the Great Basin, rather, and uh, take a look at the history of Pinus monophylla, the you know, single needle pinion pine. And we know quite a bit about it, and that's why I can make a map like this. It's easy to do. You look it up all the fossil sites, my, there must be 500 pack rat middens that have pinion pines in them, and they're dated. So um, there's good data. And we can, we can say, for example, that we know that, down, that there were no pinion pines in northern Nevada uh, during the last ice age. At least no one's ever found one. But once we get to southern Nevada, down into where it's desert today, we find uh, these pygmy forests, pinion juniper forests. And so that you can think of pinion, single needle pinion as spending, it, spending the ice age uh, somewhere south of southern Nevada. Okay? And then as we start 
to follow its move northward, this is all expected, isn't it? It's filling its range slowly. But what's really interesting is that it has, didn't finally get to its northeastern limit until 400 years ago. Uh, and it didn't really approach its modern limit until after 2,000 years ago. Uh, you know, it also goes right over here into uh, the uh, city of rocks in southern Idaho, uh, right near the Raft River Mountains. And we collected pack rat middens there last summer to try and figure out when it arrived. And I haven't done that work yet, so I can't tell you. But is it going to be 400? No, I expect to be surprised and have to change part of this map uh, when we really do find out, because there's no way to tell. It's, you know, it could have taken a leap uh, and been there for a much longer time. But anyway, the, the notion that's clear here from looking at the fossil record is that we have uh, this progress northward uh, to fill its present range, and that that present range has only been filled rather recently. So if we think of the pinion juniper uh, 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 woodlands, uh, this area of Nevada, you can see that, that they're very short-lived. The juniper, on the other hand, Utah juniper, uh, probably was there throughout the Pleistocene by itself without its pinions. Uh, so that community is new, relatively, in its northern extent. Now, can I have the next slide just for a minute? Here's another one that's been really interesting to me. Someone mentioned Ponderosa, uh, and I've been uh, really interested in this community. And you know, up in northern Idaho, we have a combination of, of trees that look like they belong more over on the coast. It's a maritime forest in northern Idaho, along with, uh, with uh, particularly uh, western hemlock and thuya. Uh, and, and other species as well, but those are the two main ones. And what else did I put up there? Well, the things that go with it, Abies grandis and, and taxis. Uh, and of course, Doug fir is always there. And the white pine. Well, we've had a, an opportunity to do some work uh, over the last few years in a place. Let me go to back to here again, in a cl place called Hager Pond. Uh, and uh, that's right here. Oops, I can't find myself upside down. Right about here. And uh, it's a very interesting story. What we see here is the present on this map. That's our, our study site, plus other sites in the Northwest. Uh, and what we see here is not the story that we saw from Pinion Pine. It goes north, from south to north and fills up its area. But what we see is something that is really different. Uh, and it works like this. This, uh, the hatch, the shaded part of this overhead is the outside limits of, oops, excuse me, of the present, uh, uh, <laughs> this, you okay? <laughs> uh, could have scared you, you know? <laughs> Lecture <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it, uh, uh, so this is the outside limits. Uh, and there's one on here that I have discovered uh, doesn't belong, well, part of this distribution is not correct that it may confuse. There's a little patch down here. This is from Little's map. And it turns out that uh, from what I've been able to find out, uh, that really doesn't exist, OK? Uh, so really, the southern limit of western hemlock is probably about the north fork of the Clearwater. Okay. Well, in any case, this is the present distribution. And Henry P. Hansen, a uh, pioneering palynologist from Oregon State University, uh, and uh, let's see, he died, I don't know, several years ago. But uh, when uh, back in the 30s, he, he, he had tested a lot of sites and did a lot of initial pollen work in the Pacific Northwest, uh, including uh, uh, some work up near Anthony Lakes, uh, as a matter of fact. Well, he looked at this place called Hager Pond. Let's get back to where we are here. Yeah, a place called Hager Pond. And he pointed out uh, in the 1930s that uh, uh, the western hemlock there was only a couple of thousand years old. Well, um, Dick Mack from Washington State University looked at the same place in the 1970s and said, uh, gee, this is only just 
just like Henry Hansen said, as part of the moist maritime forest, this is a new species recently, just the last couple of thousand years. Uh, and thought that this represented a climatic change that finally made it possible for this forest to come together, right, with all of its parts. Well, let me show you another diagram you can take. Oh, let me, while I have this up here, let me go, I'll tell you the story, then I'll show you the evidence for the story. That'll work. Um, if we look at at the western part of the distribution of western hemlock. We see that it, it is south of the ice sheet here 12,000 years ago. This uh, line is the ice sheet. Okay, so there's <laughs> not much forest here. And, uh, but once the ice sheet leaves, we see that the forest, uh, western hemlock, uh, moves northward, uh, goes on up to Alaska, and uh, into this area uh, by 7,000 years ago. The next place we see it is over on this side uh, in the mountains again. Uh, and we see that by, oh, 4,000 years ago here, 4,500 years ago here. And then we see it here and here and here about 2,000, 2,500 years ago. What's happened is it didn't move north from some refugium in the south. It moved from the coast north jumped over and then to the mountains and then moved back south again. Without the fossil record, you'd have no way of knowing that. As a matter of fact, as many of you will probably know, there are papers written on the biogeography of this forest which place it in refugiums to the south. Well, how do we get to that data? One of the ways we got to that, which is really kind of interesting, is to use a couple of techniques that we couldn't have used a few years ago. And one of them, is to establish a deposition rate with radiocarbon dates uh, so that we can tell how many years we're dealing with. And once we have that deposition rate, then we're, and we, if we have a way to tell out, tell how many pollen grains are in a sample, and that's done by introducing a tracer, so we introduce a known number of exotic like a podium spores into a sample, and then you can compare everything or one thing to that. Well, uh, so what this diagram is, is not your typical percentage pollen diagram, but it's actually a diagram that shows the pollen grains per centimeter square per year. Okay. Now, another thing has come along that's, that's made it possible to do uh, a little more detailed work, and that is a uh, method of radiocarbon dating called accelerator dating, in which case, uh, when, when we need to, we can look at a sample of a single needle, say 0 0.005 grams, and a single charred needle is enough for a radiocarbon date. Well, if a single charred needle is enough for a radiocarbon date, maybe some other small things are too. And one of these things that's small is a pollen grain. And so with my colleague, Peter Vanderwater at the University of Arizona, who had all of the facilities in a micro manipulator, we actually picked pollen grains out of the sample at this level. So here you can see the western hemlocks are approaching uh, from somewhere. You can just pick up their first pollen. And then just about at the point where it starts to increase, we thought, oh, we'll have enough that if anyone is crazy enough to sit there for two weeks and pick out pollen grains, we can actually date the pollen that's blowing into the site before the plant arrives, okay? So here's our story, and uh, here it is, 2,000 plus or minus years ago, and uh, uh, we have uh, sufficient pollen. And then here's our first macrofossil from that core, one single needle of western hemlock, and it's about 1,500 years old. Uh, so, you know, with these, with these kinds of data, you can start to build up the history of particular species and uh, how they're associated with particular communities. Okay. Do you have any questions before I go on? Okay. Well, so hopefully uh, out of some of what we've done now, you'll get the notion that the past is the key to the present. Uh, I'd like to go on and just uh, talk a little bit about the record from the Steens Mountains and then uh, go to the Blue Mountains. I think I'll take this rather rapidly so we can 
Um, and maybe just talk about one aspect of the Steens. And before I do that, uh, just a few general things um, that probably are important to understand. And one is that <clears throat> if we go to Core Lake, this is a scabland lake in central Wa in south central Washington, uh, left in the path of the great scabland flood, uh, which plucked out the basalt and sent it on down the Columbia or wherever. And uh, um, one of the things that that people ask a lot, so I thought I'd just cover it before you ask, how do you sample the top of a lake? Because you know they're soft. We do it a couple of ways, and what we've done here at uh, Blue Lake, and uh, I'm sorry, at uh, Lost Lake uh, uh, near Dale, and at Twin Lakes in the Wallawas is actually to freeze the top of the lake. So that if you have questions about changes over historic fires, uh, historic time, or a fire that say burned in, uh, 1930, can you pick it up in your record and therefore have a date? Uh, and I just wanted to show you a little bit of how that's done. You know, the l tops of lakes are so soft that if you just leave them in a core, they'll flow out the end. And uh, we found this really uh, uh, important in studying the history of volcanic, uh, recent volcanic eruptions, for example. This is just a, a box, uh, as you can see, into which dry ice is being put and broken up. And into that box, also goes uh, alcohol and a twist of lemon. <laughs> and then after uh, that, you stick it down in the lake, the bottom of the lake, and into the water column, part in the water column, and part into the sediment so that you're in the mud water interface. And uh, then uh, the, it, you pull it up in about a half hour, and it comes out like this. So you have your historic period of uh, frozen. And then what you can do is just take this put some warm water inside, saving the alcohol and, and the, the dry ice that's still left, and put a little warm water inside, and it just breaks off the outside. And you can put that in with some more ice, dry ice, take it back to the lab, clean it up a bit, put it on a bandsaw, and cut out your half centimeter slices or, or whatever you want. Uh, and you have your historic period recorded. And I need to tell you this, because I'm going to show you a diagram in just a little bit from up here in the blues that has a 1986 fire recorded in it uh, as an individual event. And what you see here is this is a frozen section. And uh, here's the uh, mud, mud water interfaces right there. There's uh, just ice. And then this is uh, the uh, uh, 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. You know, this is well preserved. Give you, to give you a notion how that's done. Okay, so that's, that's one aspect that's important. Uh, and of course, in the Pacific Northwest, dealing with volcanic ashes is, is very important. The, these are some eruptions of Mount St. Helens. I should point out that we have Mount St. Helens ash in both of the lakes in the blues, both Lost Lake and Twin Lakes. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the May 18 eruption. And notice that each one of these eruptions has a different pattern of distribution, so we don't find all of them in every core. But something like Mount Mazama or Glacier Peak, uh, let me just go to the, that map, has a much wider distribution, so we find them in most of our cores. Uh, this is, uh, these are just a few of the, of the uh, eruptions that, that, that uh, are very commonly found in the interior northwest. And there are others. There are some now that are coming from the Oregon Cascades. We have one of those in the Wallawas that hasn't even been reported outside the Cascades before. And uh, these are identified by age, and by mineral sweets, and by uh, the chemistry of the glass, which, which varies from tefer to tefer. And those are just a few of them that we look for. Um, yeah, Glacier Peak in the uh, smaller distribution, and uh, Mount Mazama in the, lar in the much larger distribution, all the way to Saskatchewan, down to central Nevada, uh, over into uh, Discordus site in northwestern Utah. You can see Great Salt Lake there, just north of Great Salt Lake, that has a um, couple of centimeters of, of Mazama ash in it. So it, it is spread, and of course, up uh, into Saskatchewan and Canada, British Columbia and Alberta. And this is, this is uh, an example of how one of these ashes looks in a core. Uh, you can also see something goes with that tephra. In this case, I've used the term tephra. It's just 
another term for volcanic ash. It's the proper term. Uh, and you can see there's evidence for something else here. There's a center of a, of a conifer cone and some broken wood, which is, uh, would suggest there was a fire. Uh, and uh, this is Mazama ash from clear over in the Bitterroot Mountains. This is from Crater Lake, seven centimeters of it. Uh, much more than, much, much more than that in the Blue Mountains. Uh, and here is a, a core, which uh, you can probably see there's some ash right there in, but it's very much older. This is also from the, uh, this uh, focus isn't working here, so if it doesn't seem in focus, I can't do anything about it from here. Uh, this is from Glacier Peak, and of course there, there are at least two episodes of eruptions from Glacier Peak. So these are very important, and of course we look for these in all the cores, and fortunately there's a nice tepper record out of the Blue Mountains. Uh, that's uh, part of it's dated now, including, as a matter of fact, uh, the uh, furthest extent of, uh, of tephra from Newberry Volcano. So, uh, yeah, there's more to come from the blues. This is uh, uh, some of the ways we are, are able to uh, get cores. This happens to be in a very deep lake. Uh, the deep, in this case, is 60 feet or so. Uh, and uh, we put our raft out before it froze, and then we let it freeze then go out and work off the raft. It just makes a better platform. Or if you're sure the ice will hold up uh, under all the pressure of coring, you can just do it on the ice. And sometimes that's problematic. So there's a place that we're totally serious about. We like to put our raft out in the, in the uh, fall and then let it freeze in. OK. Uh, and then some people say, well, how do you know where to core a lake? And I like to tell them we use a pointer. <laughs> uh, this is my old dog, Jezebel, who has been dead for many years, but she loved to go coring. She was really a coring dog. Uh, and uh, sometimes things really get going tough, and we actually have an, a, a little three horse, five horsepower engine here that will raise and lower uh, weights, in this case, uh, where uh, you can actually see that's well casing. It's scheduled 45 inch diameter pipe, it's pretty strong. And so we're driving that as casing uh, after we've already taken a core, then we case it. In this case, to get through Mazama ash, it's over five meters of ash, if you can imagine that, from uh, Mount Mazama that's washed into some of the lakes in, uh, in, in central Washington. And here in the Blue Mountains at um, Lost Lake near Dale, we have over four meters that washed into that depression. And we couldn't get through it, as a matter of fact, because we didn't bring our engine and our steel casing along. Uh, and uh, we can actually drop a 200-pound weight on that casing. And, or you can use a uh, you know, vibrating rod like you would use uh, in cement. That, that works sometimes, too. OK, so uh, just a little background. Well, here we are in the Steens Mountains. And I guess probably the most interesting thing about the Steens Mountains was the opportunity to combine pollen and pack rat midden evidence uh, together. And one of the places that this could be done was in a place called Diamond Craters. How many of you have been to Diamond Craters? Steens, a lot of you, so you know it. Well, there's one pond there in Diamond Craters called Diamond Pond. Uh, here we are, here's southeastern Oregon, uh, the Steens Mountains here, a couple of lakes, Wild Horse Lake and Fish Lake. And then here's Diamond Craters. And I just want to talk about Diamond Craters and some of the evidence for uh, um, um, vegetation change there, particularly in reference to western juniper. Uh, now this is the vegetation of the Steens Mountains today, as you can see, and as most of you probably already know, there's, except for a few uh, white fir or white fir, grand fir hybrids or whatever they are, uh, on the west side in a couple of canyons, there no, and, and juniper, there are, uh, there are really no coniferous trees there. Uh, some ponderosas were planted uh, some time ago, and a few still survive, not many. Uh, and uh, one of the questions we went there with was, well, how long has this been the case? Uh, why are there no forests in the Steens? And the answer we came up with, there are no forests in the Steens because there weren't any forests in the Steens. After the last ice age, we have cores that go back in Fish Lake to 13,000 years ago. As soon as the ice retreats from that basin, and we have sagebrush and grass, and it stays that way with some fluctuations 
for uh, 13,000 years, so all we do is see the variation in step. Okay. Uh, then, um, so, so that was really the main question we went there with. Well, in the process of doing other work, we learned much more about it. Uh, Diamond Pond is at much lower elevation. At these lower elevations, there are some lava tubes. And in these lava tubes are pack rat middens. And the pack rat midden record here goes back, oh, not very far. The work we've done, it's only four or 5,000 years. Over in the Catlow Valley, it's a little longer than that. But we've really been interested in juniper because juniper has been everybody's interest uh, in eastern Washington, I'm sorry, eastern Oregon, uh, uh, for as long as I can remember. And you all know the story about how, uh, if it's not today's story, it was yesterday's story uh, about how junipers uh, were how the, the modern invasion was unnatural. And we wanted to look back and say, see, well, is that really the case? Have junipers expanded and contracted before? Or is this really unusual? And we did that, both using uh, pack rat middens and uh, the pollen records from Diamond Pond. Here's our culprit right here. I, I can like these trees myself. And, uh, uh, but I know there are people who don't. And uh, here's Diamond Craters. And I think maybe this is a little small to show up here, but here's Diamond Pond. Uh, and then this is an attempt to put some, some vegetation here. This is shad scale. Uh, most everything else in here is sagebrush. And then there are little pieces of juniper here and there. And then every one of those localities that you see is uh, and every number up here, 9 through 14 from this locality, for example, is an individually dated pack rat midden that we've been able to look at the, the record in. The, and along with those pack rat middens, we have uh, this diamond pond, which is a mar. And that's just a, 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 an eruption crater where the, water, where the magma has contacted the uh, water table. And this gas builds up from that. And, there's an explosion. Fort Rock, I think, is the best example in Oregon. Uh, this is a small one. Uh, it has about 50 meters of sediment. I'm sorry, 50 feet of sediment in it, uh, and uh, it looks something like that. Uh, varies from year to year a little, but not much. And as you can see, the can you sharpen that a little bit? There's uh, as we look at the vegetation around here. There's uh, a little bit of Phragmites on that side, and then this is uh, mainly cattail. Uh, in fact, everything is mainly cattail this year, but there's also uh, uh, scurpus in here, too. I just can't see it right now, because the cattail is so tall. And then as soon as you leave that, you're right into shad scale desert. Uh, well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, a, a, a former student of mine, Peter Wigan, uh, worked here for his PhD, and he did for that. that 15, almost 50 feet of core, the macrofossils, the sediments, the pollen, the algae, everything he could come up with. And uh, it turns out that there's a story here of past climatic change. And that story is told in the macrofossils of the aquatic plants, the plants that grew around the outside, the emergent aquatic plants as well, and also in uh, the uh, sediments, uh, in the pollen, uh, and in the algae. And it turns out that this place has had quite a history of being shallow and then deep and shallow and then deep. And of course, every time it changes its depth uh, by any great amount, uh, the, say it got shallower, that rim of vegetation around the edge comes closer to the middle. And we eliminate uh, some of the species that would grow as uh, aquatic plants, Potomagetan, Rupia, uh, Myriophyllum, those sorts of things. So there's a there's a seed record of these. So we've been able to, I think, reconstruct, or Peter did a pretty good job. It did a pretty good job of reconstructing the, the way that that pond has looked through the past, back and forth like this, smaller and larger diameter, and then, of course, up and down at the same time. And uh, so, okay, so given that, the fact that we have those cores, now with that as a basis, we can start to look at that that juniper record. Here we are at Coring. It's a very, as you can see, it's a very small pond. Uh, and if, and uh, if we look today at the area around Diamond Pond, there are a few junipers, and none of them are very old. Okay? Uh, and
and well, none of them. I'm, most of them are not very old. Most of them are from recent invasion. But we can go out into an area like this in which there are no junipers within the home range of a pack rat and crawl into the, into the uh, caves and from those caves find pack rat middens that actually uh, date to, uh, you know, this doesn't show up because of the lights, but there's a lava flow right here that has one of those lava tubes in it that is full of pack rat middens and those pack rat middens are of different ages and they're dominated sometimes by junipers and sometimes not. Uh, and if we put them all together, we see a record that looks like this. The bottom is this, all the radiocarbon dates uh, plotted as though the, uh, everything under this curve is uh, three standard deviations. So it's a probability of 99 point something uh, that, uh, that, that, that uh, radiocarbon date falls within that space along the bottom of the line. And then the height here tells you uh, what the plus or minus was on the date, how good the dating was. But all of the curves actually cover the same area. Now, if you add all the area under all the curves, you see that at Diamond Craters wood rat, in the wood rat middens, we get a record that looks like that. There are periods, and these are wood rat middens with juniper. And so that juniper has fluctuated in the past. It has a chronology. Uh, we can see when it was there and when it was abundant, and perhaps when it wasn't. But of course, that's not enough. You could have just missed some pack rat middens. So we then can compare this to the continuous le record in Diamond Pond and uh, see that we have the same story. Another thing that is really interesting is that we can't find junipers in southeastern Oregon that, that is western juniper that is more than 4,000, 4,500 years old. Uh, I've come to think that maybe they're just not here and that the juniper quote unquote invasion uh, didn't start in historic time. It started about 5,000 years ago. But that's another story. Let me show you the comparison here. I just did this again using tree ring corrected dates. Uh, um, it spreads it out just a little bit. Uh, you see the same thing. Uh, yeah. So there's another story here as well. When we look at the pollen record, we can see several things. One, remember the, in that last one, the last diagram I showed you, there were lots of juniper remains in this period around, 5, 000, around 4,000 to 2,000 years ago. Lots of pack rat middens dating from that age. And so we can look at the pollen record and add something to that. We take the grass sagebrush ratio so there'd be increasing grass as we go this direction and towards me is sagebrush that uh, in fact in that mid in this period between two and four thousand years ago when the junipers seem to be more abundant than they are today that it's also a period when grass is more abundant than sagebrush another thing we can do is look at the charcoal pollen ratio now you can imagine it's just a, a just a tool that that seems to work many times is that if we look at the charcoal uh, we actually, when we are looking at pollen in our slides, we can count charcoal fragments. And if there are many charcoal fragments in relation to pollen, that indicates, well, first of all, there's more charcoal fragments. And, and they look like there are more in relation to pollen because uh, if either the pollen rain is constant and there's just more charcoal, or actually you destroyed part of the vegetation in a fire. So uh, we also see that more fires go with that same period. So there's, there are some connections here. So that's the story of Western Juniper. Okay, uh, and you see it here with the pack rat middens with, with the Juniper, uh, uh, the sum of all the dates in the second line and the top line is, are the percentages. Uh, am I running out of time here? I'm sorry, I can't see the clock. Does everyone have to leave here? Yeah, you've got uh, yeah, a number of people will have to leave in about 10 minutes. In 10 minutes? It's time I got to the Blue Mountains. I'm going to leave the rest of, uh, of uh, Eastern Oregon go. Uh, yes, just let me uh, go on through here. Fish Lake, of course, more records, more that you don't. OK, well, here we are at Lost Lake. Uh, and. We cored Lost Lake in 1987. In 1986, there was, there was a hell of a fire there, I'll tell you. And it swept up the canyon. 
and it is a duff destroying fire. If you go there today, the mineral soil is black and orange and uh, in, in many places and ashy, and it's still that way. So it was a very hot fire over part of the area. Now, uh, we were able to get cores from Lost Lake that went back, whoops, uh, to Mount Mazama because we didn't have our really heavy duty equipment with us when we went there and we got into Mazama something more than four meters of tephra uh, and we couldn't, we just couldn't get through with what we had. So the record goes back until about, um, uh, I'm going to move back here a minute. Stay out of here. Till, uh, to, Mount, to about the time of Mount Mazama. Now, a couple of things you can see here are the depths of some of the dates, the material dated, and you notice in some cases, uh, we actually dated an area, uh, where, dated where there was evidence for fire, so it's on dispersed charcoal. In other cases, we actually dated uh, individual needles or cone scales or something like that. And uh, here's a case where we have an ulnus twig, uh, a pinus contorted needle. What else do we have here? And more, no more pinus contorted needle. So, uh, I think we had uh, two or three here and two or three here. And so we could actually pull out an individual charred needle and date it, which gave us a date on the needle and on a fire. So first of all, we had to establish the dating. Um, the next thing, whoops, was that when we looked into the cores, we noticed that there were distinct bands of charcoal, and that these distinct bands of charcoal fortunately had within them lots of macrofossils that preserved very well because they were charred, uh, and also more sand and silt. So just let me show you, there were in some, I think, 16 bands. Uh, now, uh, and what you see here uh, are, uh, the thicknesses of these, okay, how thick was this band of charcoal in the core? So, uh, and um, then the next thing is, is the radiocarbon age, and then if we calibrate that with, radi with, uh, with uh, the tree ring correction curve, these are the actual, you know, years ago uh, in, uh, in, in, in actual ages, you know, there's, there's a difference between real years and radiocarbon years, and there's about 800 years difference at the time of Mazama ash. So that's how it would look. And a couple of things are interesting here. Through, as we looked at the macrofossils, throughout this record, very little change. The site today is in that mixed uh, forest uh, with lots of larch, dug fir, uh, with uh, lodgepole pine, and those are really the important species there. And if you look at this, uh, oh, oh, and, uh, and grand fir, uh, and, uh, or grand fir con color, or something like that. Okay, so you can see that as, as in each of those, we keep, it looks like the forest, in terms of what's ending up as macrofossils in that record, is about the same. And it has been since the time of Mazama, except for one thing. Within the forest, at the elevation of the lake, uh, the, the alp, subalp and fir are just a little bit higher up in the cirque. Okay? The lake is moraine dam, and there's no ponderosa pine at the site. Now, in an area that was burned in 86, and which faces more to the west, there are a few ponderosa pine seedlings, but that's it. And it's kind of interesting. When we look at this very bottom layer, if I just draw your attention to this one, it, this is uh, down in Mazama ash, and uh, it's 20 centimeters thick. Can you imagine a 20 centimeter thick band of charcoal mixed in with redeposited Mazama ash? And then when we look at the macrofossils, there's dug fir, larch, grand fir, I guess. It looks like it from the needle cross section. Some alpine fir, different needle cross section. Lodgepole pine and ponderosa pine. Uh, so we actually have fascicle of ponderosa where it doesn't grow today. Uh, that part of the record is kind of interesting. After that, uh, I haven't looked at these levels yet. After that, uh, we don't see it again. We also don't see it uh, 
uh, any indication of a large pollen grain that would be likely ponderosa ever being more abundant than it is in the modern pollen rain. And of course, it blows all over, so we do get a little. Um, now, so we have a macrofossil record that's coming along fairly well, uh, which ended, suggests that the actual major species in that forest uh, haven't changed that much uh, since the fall of Mazama. Uh, what we don't have is a sample that would take us back a thousand years or so before Mazama uh, that would help understand that situation a little better. Well, by uh, putting, uh, by, the by using the radiocarbon dates and depth and a fourth order polynomial, we put together a deposition rate curve that looks something like this in each triangle is a pollen sample, a sample where we would count charcoal, pollen, algae, and a few other things. For example, uh, oh, say, uh, particular kinds of leaf hairs of plants. Uh, Nufar uh, pond lily has a couple of leaf hairs that are very distinctive. And so even if you don't have seeds or pollen, you know it's there because these hairs come through. Uh, sclerids uh, uh, Nufar are very distinctive. So uh, this is the record we have so far for uh, Lost Lake, and you can see most of the samples are near the top because uh, this uh, work that we've been doing in the last year and a half is supported by, uh, as I mentioned earlier, through the uh, office at uh, John Day on a challenge grant, and uh, we just didn't have enough support to uh, go any further than that. But that'll give you an idea of the sampling. <coughs> now, <coughs> if the, if, I don't want to say there's no change in the forest because there is, but the major species aren't changing, so I want to say a few words about fire. Uh, you saw that we had particular uh, layers that would indicate fires, probably duff destroying fires, severe fires, so that after the fires, we'd have charcoal washed in, in maybe in the spring freshets. Uh, and when we put our charcoal data, this is again Lost Lake, uh, and look at it in terms of charcoal per centimeter square per year, which we, are, which we can do because we have the deposition rate curve and we, and we need that. Okay? So once you establish that, and then what we can see is that there's a period in here. Here's time is over on the left-hand side. Is, uh, that's your right-hand side, sorry. Is on the uh, right-hand side, and depth is on the left-hand side. So. We look at that period between 2,000 and 3,400 years ago, and looking here, you can see that. And this curve is for pollen that's 20. I'm sorry, charcoal that's 25 to 50 microns. Uh, this curve is for charcoal that is 50 to 100 microns, and this is for charcoal that is more than 100 microns. So it comes in different sizes, and we keep track of it that way. And then this is the sum of all charcoal. Uh, and what we see is that uh, this is what our, that uh, very hot fire in 1986 looked like. It shows up in our records, and that's because we froze the top of the lake and we were able to cut it, up, cut it very thinly. And there's what it looks like. <clears throat> if we go back in time, uh, what we see is that back here between 2000 and about 3,400 years ago, that there were many times, you can see them all here, where where there was a superabundance of uh, charcoal. Earlier on, I mentioned that sometimes we use a charcoal pollen ratio uh, to look at that situation. And uh, here's the charcoal pollen ratio. OK. So as it turns out, uh, by sampling fairly closely, uh, we're able to establish the number of large fires. Uh, and where we haven't sampled closely enough in the bottom of this record, there's not much you can say because, you know, it's just hit and miss. Uh, so it requires some very close interval sampling to be able to, to get a record like we have in the upper half there. Let's see. Fire. Another thing that's another way to look at this is, um, is to look at the weight loss on ignition. If we take a samples, continuous samples down our core, and we dry those at 105 degrees centigrade till they're actually dry, dry them for a couple of days, and then 
burn them in a furnace at 550, 600 degrees centigrade, we lose the organic carbon. And it's weight loss on ignition. It's just a, a quick method of, and a fairly good method, of determining how much organic carbon is in the sample. If we were in a limestone area or we're working with marls, then we'd weigh that and then have to burn it again at 950 degrees C, and that would be carbonate carbon. That's carbon that's tied up in carbonates. Um, and uh, so the organic weight loss from these samples are give us a, uh, percent organic carbon, give us another measure of fires. As you can see, here is a, 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 a tephra. I, they were on the last illustration as well. I just stayed with the charcoal on that one. Okay, here's a tephra layer. Uh, here's Mount Mazama. This is 700. Uh, uh, calibrated year, 7,000 calibrated years ago. This tephra is uh, more than likely from uh, uh, Newberry craters, and this would be the furthest extent of its distribution. Uh, and then just before that is a, a layer of charcoal, another layer of charcoal. Each of these is a charcoal layer, and we go on up here, and here's another tephra, and that's probably from Mount St. Helens, Washington. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, in looking at this is that every time there is uh, uh, a, a little bit of washing into the lake with this charcoal, here's a charcoal band, here's a charcoal band, uh, we actually get a decrease in the percent organic matter and you can see why is because when you have washing, what you're doing is adding more uh, sediment, more silt to uh, that sample and therefore even though you're putting charcoal in, uh, it will have a little lesser organic content. And so in places where uh, we uh, don't have uh, charcoal bands, we have this. You know, this sharp decreases. And here we go. Here's two that go with charcoal bands. These sharp decreases in percent organic matter. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I know our time is short here, but so I'm not going to go back and do it. But I will tell you that, that if we compare this with the charcoal counts I just showed you, they come out pretty much on the nose. So we have all kinds of information here on the frequency, and I think a little bit on the intensity of fire at uh, Lost Lake. Well, let me, uh, I'm going to do one more thing, because it looks like I have uh, 30 seconds. Uh, and uh, uh, you'll like this, I hope. One of the things we've noticed is a question of how far back in the record should you go to understand uh, oh, things about the ecosystem now that, that we're trying to manage. And uh, it's a good question. And it turns out that if we look at, for example, the mountains of western Montana, let's push that over a little bit more, um, and these are all sites that we've worked on there, uh, Lost Trail Pass Bog, uh, Mary's Pond, in Sheep Mountain Bog. These are all from Missoula south to Lost Trail. One of the things we noticed is that if we forget about the pine pollen, just look at the percentages of Douglas fir, of fir, and of spruce, that the mid-Holocene forests of, of uh, that area, uh, oh, well, I'd say all along the Bitterroots, uh, and then east and west from there, uh, the mid-Holocene forests are dominated by dug fir. Over and over and over again, that's our most abundant macrofossil, and it's our most abundant, and lots of lodgepole pine, I might add, as well. And, and it's our most abundant macrofossil. Uh, and if we put all our records together, of course, there are different elevations and there are different forests involved, but what you see is uh, that about 4,000 years ago, so here's the 4,000 scale about right there, Somewhere in that vicinity, there's a change, and we begin to get more spruce and fir, depending on where we are, and less dug fir. And if we plot it as a ternary diagram, uh, it would look something like this. Let me go up here where I don't have to. Here is uh, dug fir, fir, and spruce. So this would be 100%, 100% fir, 100% dug fir, 100% spruce. So if we had dug fir as our dominant pollen type, uh, we'd be off in this corner. If we had uh, fir as our dominant pollen type, we'd be up here. And if we had spruce, we'd be here. But what you can see happens, if we take all the sites, 
all of this data, and we look at it, and here's um, Mazama to 4,000 years ago. So that's about 7,600 real years to uh, about 4,400 years, real years ago. We find, because these are in BP, radiocarbon years, we find that we have all of our distributions here, and that as we go from less than 4,000 radiocarbon years ago to the present, that they're here. Do you see that? So the Doug fir has, uh, after several thousands of years of occupying that position of important pollen type and uh, important macrofossils as well, I might add, does that. And what happens at, at Lost Lake in the Blue Mountains? There it is. It's the same story. Uh, and uh, uh, it's... Uh, looks like this. I've, I've taken those three that I showed you from further uh, east uh, in western Montana and then here is Lost Lake. So this is the last, four th this is 4,000 years ago to Mazama and this is the last 4,000 years. So there's a, there's, there, there, there is a regional pattern uh, here it looks like, or at least there's a regional pattern in western Montana and we first tried to investigate to see if that pattern is about the same. Here it is. And it seems like the major shift comes about 4,000 years ago. I'm out of time. And I'll be around for a little bit. Let me tell you that uh, if you uh, would like to know more about uh, this, uh, any of these sites or these, these localities that uh, you can get a copy of a review I wrote that sat from Walla Walla and uh, it discusses the relationship of these more than you want to know. Uh, and if you're interested in the first work that, that we've done on the blues at Lost Lake, I have a report that's overdue, but it's going to be finished next weekend. And you can obtain that from, uh, from the office in John Day. So there are a few things out there, I think, that uh, that uh, if you're interested, you can actually get caught up on uh, fairly easily. Uh, I, I'm out of time, so I'm going to leave it there. But I'd be happy to sit around and talk uh, to anyone for as long as they'd like about secrets of the past. Okay, I think I'll leave uh, everybody uh, that needs to leave, give them a chance to leave. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, then we can ask questions for those people who want to linger on a bit. Jim, I want to mention that there's uh, one of the Blue Mountains Institute seminar series is going on tomorrow.